Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Reality Is. As always, it's newer, and I'm back today a day later than I promised, but happy Mother's Day to everybody. Um... I was supposed to release this episode yesterday, but I just didn't. <laughs> I I had a very relaxing Saturday and I didn't feel like recording, okay? And like I said on the episode that I released on Friday, okay, it is Mother's Day weekend and I am not sticking to a schedule, okay? We'll go back to normal next week, but today's episode I'm going to be talking about Summer House and Vanderpump Rules and I'm going to try to keep it brief. It's going to be a little mini because... I know it's already been a couple of days and I think we're all kind of um, Danielle'd out and Tom Sandoval'd out, but hopefully today I talk about things that maybe you haven't thought about in listening to probably the 10,000 other podcasts everybody listens to. So let's jump into Summer House. Um, You know, this episode of Summer House had the aftermath of the Carl and Lindsay proposal and we just watched Danielle. Oliveira lose her goddamn mind. She's she is losing it, guys. It's a mess. She's let's just talk about why I think she's upset, okay? I think she's upset that she was cut out because I I don't think that she okay. I don't think that she is crying and having a meltdown and going around from person to person because she wants the engagement to be about her, but I think it is a realization that her friends are moving on without her. You know, she realizes that her not being Lindsay's number one supporter and being like fully gung ho about Carl and Lindsay is is something that for the first time probably in her relationship with Lindsay, right? Like I'm sure in the past when Lindsay's dated other people and Danielle has been like, mm, I don't know, I think you should think about X, Y, and Z with her other with her previous relationships. Lindsay has said, okay, I'm going to actually take Danielle's advice. It's possible that she's done that. It's also possible that Lindsay's never done that because Lindsay doesn't really strike me as the kind of person that would take anybody's advice. But it's possible that in the past, Danielle has been a voice of reason to Lindsay and Lindsay has actually responded quite well. But in this situation, because Lindsay responded the way she did, I think I think Danielle is also crying and having a meltdown because she realizes that she fucked up. And I think a lot of her like aggression and irritation is that she's really mad about her, mad at herself. Like her sobbing in the in the bathroom and saying, I can do this, I can do this. I think it's a realization that she really fucked up with Lindsay. Like, you know, um, Paige says that Carl's biggest fear is making Lindsay mad. I mean, <laughs> Carl's and I think everybody else's, but I think also Danielle's biggest fear is making Lindsay mad. I think that Danielle has always known, like I said before on previous Summer House episodes, that you know who your friend is. And I think that Danielle is realizing that she is going to get Lindsay's wrath that she's never had to get before, but she's been very aware, front and center, popcorn in hand watching Lindsay do these kinds of things to other people, right? Cut them out because they're not, and not just cut them out, like she's iced people out. Lindsay has iced people out. The very first big fight between Lindsay and Amanda was that Lindsay cut Amanda out of a picture. You know, I'll never forget the very first like Summer House reunion they did in like uh, the Watch What Happens Live studio in the clubhouse or whatever. And it was very sad, but I'll never forget that episode. It Danielle was in there being like, well, Amanda, maybe we'll have this year for you to prove out like, you know, whether or not you can really be friends with us. So I don't think Danielle has always been all like so welcoming and so kind to these other girls. You know, I think that she's always been Lindsay's lackey. Like she's always been 
doing whatever Lindsay does. And I think that when she's watched people ice, when she's watched Lindsay ice people out, Danielle has also iced people out. And I think now Danielle knows that she's the one getting iced out and it fucking sucks to be treated the way you probably treated other people. I'm not saying that makes it like, okay for Danielle to feel this way. I understand that she might feel this way, but I also think this is ridiculous. Like you should only be mad at yourself. You should only be mad at yourself. You had days. You had days to make things up with Lindsay. You had days to talk to her. Whenever Lindsay has tried to talk to you, you have stormed off, you have cried, and you have said, I can't do this. You're not clear about what you need. And now friends are moving on without you and you have to deal with it and you have to move on. Um, so I did laugh when they're talking about, when they're talking about, um, (laughs) when she's like, I'm going to go to this, I'm going to go to this engagement in dungarees and Paige doesn't know what dungarees are. (laughs) Then they're going to go to a place called Dockers. And I feel like unless you are around and like actively watching television in like the nineties, I don't you associate dungarees with Dockers, like the brand Dockers, the pants brand. So it just made me laugh that like Danielle didn't want to wear dungarees to an engagement party at Dockers. And I was like, babe, that's perfect. <laughs> so I don't think that you need to be super dressed up. Also, she just threw on a blazer. It was whatever. Anyway, um, I also want to note the fact that like Sierra being like, if Paige got proposed to by Craig and Craig didn't tell me, I would kill him. I'm sorry, but why, what is this new tradition of people having to tell people's like significant, sorry, people having to tell their girlfriend or boyfriend's friends that they're going to propose? Is this new? Because I don't understand. Family, sure, I understand. But why do I have to tell, like if I am wanting to propose to someone, why do I have to tell my significant other's friends that I'm going to propose to them? It has literally nothing to do with you. Did Kyle go and tell everybody in the house that he was going to propose to Amanda? I don't believe that he did. It's literally not anybody's business. So I don't understand this thing of like, I wasn't told. And by the way, Danielle, you were told. You were told by Carl that he was purchasing engagement rings and then you screamed into a pillow. So I don't know what else you would want from this man, you know? Um... And then even at the party when she's like, oh, Lindsay didn't tell me anything. Well, you, when Lindsay told you that you they were moving forward and things were getting really serious and they were buying living in a, an expensive apartment and bought a car together and she wanted to have his babies, you told her no. You told her you didn't like that and you thought it was weird. So why would Lindsay go and tell you that she and Carl are probably going to get engaged soon? Why would she tell you? It literally makes no sense. They get to this party and Paige and Maya are being real bitchy betties. They're like, it's weird that Carl's mom's not here. It's none of your, again, it's none of your business. It is none of your business. They're snickering while Danielle is just bitching to everybody. Like, Danielle, I hope you realize Paige and Maya are not your friends. They are not your friends. They are laughing. They're there. They spend the entire episode laughing at Danielle. Like even when Danielle comes into the room looking sad at the end of the episode, Paige and Maya are like cackling. They're like, I don't know why this is so funny to us. And Danielle's like, I'm sad. And she's like, oh, I don't know why it's so funny. What? Like those are not your friends, okay? At the party when Lindsay's like going around hugging everybody, like she's like hugging her family or whatever, there's this moment that I don't – I had to like rewind a couple of times to pay attention to it so you may have missed it. But she's – you know, she hugs her family. She hugs some of her closest friends. And then she goes to hug the castmates and there's Kyle and then there's Danielle. And Kyle does this thing where he's like, I'm going to get her. I'm going to get her. And he like hugs her and Danielle sort of like hugs Lindsay at the same time. And kind of like grab hugs Lindsay from the back as Lindsay is hugging Kyle. And it just felt like to me like there is a weird competition thing between Danielle and Lindsay. I'm sorry, Danielle and Kyle. And I realized in that moment that one of the other reasons why Danielle is probably really pissed off is the fact that in the beginning of the season, Kyle said awful things about Lindsay. 
terrible things about Lindsay. He called her a bitch. He said she was a manipulate. He she was manipulative. She was evil. He said absolutely awful things about Lindsay. So how does Kyle get to be told and confided in about the engagement, but Danielle doesn't because she said, hey, I think you should slow down. I like in that moment, I was like, okay, I understand why Danielle might be really, really mad because I do think that Danielle is getting treated worse than Kyle was. And I think that that's kind of, it's complicated also because I think how Carl navigates conflict and the way Lindsay navigates conflict are just vastly, vastly different. As far as Carl was concerned, he didn't have to tell Lindsay, or sorry, he didn't have to tell Danielle what was going on because he had already told her, like, this is in motion. We're probably going to go move forward with this. I'm looking at engagement rings, which, of course, Danielle did not react very well to. But he told her the amount that he needed to tell her. If Carl had pulled Danielle aside at the uh, at the party in the city, I think for Sierra, and he said, hey, by the way, I'm probably going to pro- I'm going to propose to Lindsay this weekend. I wanted to give you a heads up. It's going to happen. Danielle would have screamed into a pillow. She would have been really, really weird about it. She would have not reacted well to it because she already has proven that she's not reacted well to Lindsay and Carl moving forward in any way at all. And I think when it comes to Danielle, because Carl's beef, or I'm sorry, because Danielle's beef is with Lindsay, I think that he was like, I'm not going to figure out how, like, I'm not going to fight Lindsay's battles. I'm not even going to cross that. Like with, with Kyle and Carl, I think the reason why it got resolved is because Kyle is Carl's friend and Kyle was saying shit about Carl's girlfriend. So Carl and Kyle talked about it and they resolved it. In this situation with Lindsay and Danielle, Lindsay and Danielle were like sisters. So Lindsay and Danielle have beef with each other because Danielle has been saying stuff about Carl, not maybe being all the way there, whatever. And, or like not ready for, I don't know what Danielle has even said about Carl to Lindsay about the relationship. But regardless, Danielle and Lindsay have beef because of the things that Danielle has maybe said about Carl. That's for Lindsay and Danielle to hash out. And until they hash that out, Carl's not going to try to get in the middle of that, right? And I think maybe that's why Carl's like, I already dealt with it with Kyle and now me and Kyle are fine and that's why I can confide in him. Is it fucked up? I do think it's fucked up. It's fucked up for Kyle to be included in this engagement and Danielle, sorry, not included. It's, it is fucked up that Kyle got a heads up and fucking Chris got a heads up, but Danielle didn't. But again, I think it's because Lindsay's standard for what she expects from her friends is very different than what Carl expects from his friends. And so Carl's not going to lower Lindsay's standards and Carl's not going to mend Lindsay's like issues with people because it's not his problem. And that's also, I think, why at the end when Robert is chatting with Dan- with Carl and telling him all these things – that honestly, I think Danielle should be saying to Lindsay that he kind of storms out because he's like, I'm not going to be made to feel bad because of something that happened between my fiance and her friend. That is for my fiance to deal with her friend. It is not my fault. And I think that that is, and they're putting it on Carl because they're like, well, you should have told her. Again, he did tell her, but it makes me feel bad for Carl because I think that he is somebody like if I think about his journey with like even abusing substances, he always said like, I'm not, I don't know who how to be around people when I'm not drinking because it comes from a place of like low self-worth. So if he always wants to want it to be the life of the party and he thought that he wasn't likable if he wasn't drinking, he is somebody who probably needs a lot of external validation. He wants to be well-liked. He wants to be He wants to be enjoyed by people. So for him to hear that he has now disappointed someone, I think is probably really hard on him. You know, I think that Robert has a couple of things, great points, right? That he makes about Danielle being the one who's picked up the pieces, Danielle always being the one that's there for all those things are true, but those are things that Danielle should be saying to Lindsay. 
this is not Robert's place to jump in here and say these things to Carl. Why are you saying this to Carl? And then for Robert to say, I don't want to cloud your engagement, but now you're just two people who got engaged who we knew once. Like, it's rude as hell, and I don't understand what the purpose of it is. It, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the conversation with, like, uh, Raquel and Katie at the end of uh, Vanderpump Rules. Like, what is the purpose of this conversation except to make me feel bad? I can't turn back time. I can't do anything about it now. I don't know what you want me to do. Because also, it's not just the fact that you you your girlfriend feels ex- excluded, Robert. It's that your girlfriend made went made an ass of herself at our engagement party by complaining that she wasn't included. So like we're skipping over what Danielle did in her reaction to feeling excluded, right? We're just going to skip over that because it feels like Robert saying all these things about like, I don't, you guys are just two people who got engaged who we knew once. That's fucked up. But like, if, if you believe those things now, Robert, your girlfriend sure is acting like that too. She's acting like, you know what? <laughs> Danielle is now going to be the girl that used to be Lindsay's best friend who made an ass out of herself at Lindsay's engagement party. So yeah, you they might just be a couple that you knew once, but you guys are a couple that made assholes of yourself at their engagement party. And I think that no being former friends is better than <laughs> being current enemies. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Um, he also, Robert says, it hurts me that we can't be happy for you. Yes, you can. You can be happy for them if you want to. You're choosing not to be happy for them because you guys are assholes. Anyway, um, one other thing that I wanted to talk about on this episode of Summer House was the little scene that Amanda had. So Amanda, we know this season has been struggling with hair loss and weight loss and not getting her period. And so she goes to the doctor and she finds out that she has low, a low estrogen diagnosis. Her estrogen levels are somebody who would be postmenopausal. So she is going to start hormone therapy with an endocrinologist and everything like that. And I want to bring up this scene because I don't like Amanda and Kyle, but I did really, really like this scene because I think it's important to talk about like Amanda is a woman in her early thirties. And I don't think that a lot of women realize what is going on inside of their bodies. I think that female reproductive health is still really something that isn't accessible to everybody. I know that's true for a lot of people around the country, especially in red states, but I think accessibility and actually awareness of female health is so um, is so rare because a female reproductive health is really something that's, you know, kind of hushed around. I mean, but there's like, you know, period shame. Period shame is real. And like the pain that women are feeling is something that we don't often talk about. Um, you know, can, being having PMS or having cramps is is viewed as um, like a like a flaw or a weakness in women. And so, as a result, a lot of us don't talk about it. A lot of us don't talk about what is going on in our bodies because we feel like we are complaining. We feel like there's something wrong with us. We feel broken if our reproductive system isn't working the same way that everybody else's is. But the truth is, everybody's reproductive system and everybody's body is working completely differently. And the more we talk about it, the more we bring awareness to these kinds of issues, the higher chances are that women will then women and people with uteruses will go and get the appropriate care that they need. And I'm really excited for Amanda that I'm really happy that Amanda had this conversation on camera um, because she's a young person who never thought that this was going to happen to her. And the truth of the matter is these kinds of issues don't hit people in a certain age group or a race or anything. It is possible for anybody who has a uterus to be going through these things. And I think it's important for us to make sure that you, we are all on top of our reproductive health, um, regardless of our age. I also think this is important because Amanda's solution now is going to be to get hormone therapy, right? Hormone therapy is a gender affirming healthcare practice. Okay. Hormone therapy is gender affirming care. So currently in our country, we have so many people, we have states banning gender affirming care for people under the fear that we are going to be, you know, mutilating children and pediatricians are trying to, you know, castrate boys and turn them into girls because there's this like massive transphobic fear that is spreading across this stupid fucking country. But what people don't realize is that banning hormone therapy 
banning gender affirming care does not just affect trans people or non-binary people. It also affects cis people. Hormone, Hormone therapy is something that cis men do, cis women do. So it's not something that is just specific to trans people or non-binary people. And I think it's important because Corey, and if you're on my Instagram, you know that I've been like not shutting the fuck up about it. But Corey is somebody who is Corey Kiefer, Sam's boyfriend, who everybody is loving. He is a transphobe. He is a homophobe. He's a misogynist and he's a racist. Go to Countess and Frenemies Instagram and check out. They have a highlight. This man has been, first of all, we should have known because birds of a feather go to clan rallies together. He and Craig probably believe the same exact shit. I'll never forget Craig and Austin Kroll going on Instagram live with Tommy Lahren. And if you're on this podcast and you're wondering, oh, I don't want to hear about any of that. Fuck off. This podcast is not for you. Okay. Anyway, they suck. <laughs> and I should have known better. But Corey has been liking and following tons and tons of massively transphobic, misogynist, racist content on Instagram. And it is super duper triggering and super duper problematic. And what really makes me mad is that Corey, his whole shtick on the show was to be like, I'm a macho man who wears pearls. Okay. So it's okay for you to bend gender norms for yourself so that you have a shtick on TV, but it's not okay for people to be non-binary or trans. Like him being a transphobe who likes and follows hateful rhetoric, um, hateful transphobic and homophobic rhetoric about trans and non-binary people while making his thing on TV that, oh, I'm a man who wears pearls, is an example of how transphobia and homophobia often are rooted in a fear, a hypocritical fear that cis people have of having their own identity, their own gender, and their own identity questioned. The reason why it's so triggering for men to see women, I'm sorry, for men to see trans women or for men to see non-binary people is because it makes them question whether or not they're doing something, why, whether or not they're existing in a way where their own masculinity could be questioned. And the same goes for women. The same goes for women who are so deeply transphobic, women that are so deeply uh, hateful to non-binary people. They look at women who bend gender norms And it makes them question what they themselves have been doing within the box that they live in. They themselves worry about what it means for them to now be a woman. Everything they know about being a woman is based on a patriarchal idea of what is a societal gender norm. And the fact that trans and non-binary people question that and say, do what you actually love to do. Don't just do it because you think that society has told you that these are the requirements of what it means to be a woman or what it means to be a man, that shit fucks them up. And they don't want to think about it. And they don't want to be questioned about it. My femininity, my masculinity is so important to me as a person. It makes me who I am. It shouldn't. What your sex is and what your biological makeup is should not be who you are defined by. It is just a body that you exist in. Who you actually are is what matters. And what Corey is, is a transphobe who would be blocking gender affirming care for somebody like Amanda who is dealing with a low estrogen diagnosis. Okay. Okay. That's the end of my rant on Summer House. Let's take a quick break. I'm going to get a swig of water. Ugh, because my throat is dry from all this ranting and raving. And I will be back to talk about Vanderpump Rules. Okay, we're back with Vanderpump Rules. Um, All right, so this finale, this is not, this was originally the finale, and then this was the penultimate episode of Vanderpump Rules. Um, Oh, God, like I said, I know that this episode has already aired like three days ago, so you might be all fucking Sandoval and raquel out, but hopefully I can, I don't know, impart some wisdom and things that maybe haven't been discussed before. So, This episode we had that um, started with uh, the something about her party getting set up with Ariana and Katie and Chef Penny and their location. And Katie and Ariana talk about the Labor Day debacle with Lala and Tom Sandoval, obviously. And Ariana says essentially what I figured out, I want to pat myself on the back, about why she's navigating this the way that she is, which is that 
you know, the other women are triggered by Tom for being shitty because they've had shitty experiences in their relationship, but that's not necessarily true for Ariana, which of course breaks my heart because spoiler alert, it is true for Ariana, right? Ariana knows the game on this show is undermining relationships and whispering and all that. And Ariana, since the beginning of her time on Vanderpump Rules, has navigated her relationship on a show in a very chill, laid back way where a focus on her has always been me as an individual, not me as Tom's girlfriend, me as an individual, not necessarily me as, um, you know, me and Tom Sandoval as an item together because she, you know, I, I think that's probably one of the reasons why she has a relationship with Stassi, why she has a relationship with even Kristen is because She's not somebody who is always going to navigate friendships or relationships based on who her friends like or don't like, right? So even the situation with like Tom and Katie and Schwartz and everything like that, Ariana is still making sure that she is there for Katie because just because she's friends with Raquel or just because she's friends with Tom, uh, what, just because she's Tom's girlfriend or because she's buddies with shorts doesn't mean that she's going to be like devoid of logic in certain situations. So how she's navigating her relationship in the situation is to say like, just because shit was bad for you guys in certain situations doesn't mean that it's not, it's the same for me. Of course, like I said, it is the same for her. She just doesn't realize it. But I think that goes to show that Ariana just wants to continuously navigate these situations differently than the rest of the women on the show because she's very different than the rest of the women on the show. Um, Raquel and Charlie go shopping. Fuck Raquel. Raquel buys a lightning bolt necklace and she bitches about Katie and Katie's mom, Terry, who is a gem. And Raquel says things like she's finally putting herself first. She's not going to compromise on things that keep her from being her true self. But the irony here is that Raquel is not being her true self. Raquel is buying a lightning bolt necklace because Tom Sandoval wears lightning bolt things. Their Tom Tom logo has lightning bolts on it. Do you think that she heard she just randomly was like, ooh, lightning bolts. Yeah, I like that. No. Raquel's not even being herself in this situation because she's just doing whatever Sandoval likes. And you'll see more examples of it throughout this episode. The Toms have like a sad sack scene at their stupid restaurant that didn't open. And this is where Tom complains about stupid shit about Ariana and Schwartz pretends to give him some advice. And at this point, we all know that the two of them know that Tom is fucking Raquel and Schwartz knows that he's being used as a decoy. So this whole scene where Tom is like complaining about Ariana not buying fucking pens and batteries as if that fucking matters is bullshit. Also, he says multiple times on this episode that my my mere presence annoys you. There are people obviously on the internet, God bless them, who have already pulled up scenes from Vanderpump Rules early seasons where he says the exact same thing about Kristen. No. Ariana doesn't annoy you or sorry, Ariana or your presence doesn't annoy Ariana. It annoys you that Ariana doesn't worship the ground that you walk on. So it's, it's not about her being annoyed by you. It's her not thinking that you're the hottest thing since sliced bread. That's all it is. And you're a narcissist and a piece of shit. Um, Ariana and Tom have a very annoying scene, not because of Ariana, obviously, but they have a scene where They discuss their relationship, and this is not the first time Ariana is having to explain what she needs to Tom Sandoval. She's been very, very clear about what she needs from this man. She wants a mature relationship. She wants to navigate her relationship like mature adults do. Let's cook together. Let's spend time together. Let's listen to music together. Let's do things together, and all Tom wants to do is get fucked up. He's like, I think quality time would be skinny dipping. Yeah, she did skinny dip with you in Mexico. And what did you do? You fucked her friend. So fuck you. He wants to continue acting like they did when they were in their 20s. And what I think Ariana's trying to say is like, we're not that age anymore and our our lifestyles have changed, but that doesn't mean that I don't want to spend time with you. And on the topic of, oh, you know, you have to be sexually available to me or that they are going through a dry spell. Ariana's explained this to Tom before. There's a scene from like a couple of seasons ago where he was like, I feel like early in our relationships, it was like multiple orgasms every time. And Ariana's like, I don't think that that was ever the case. But I think that she brings up a really good point, which is 
You have to be around for me to want to be with you. Emotional connection is really fucking important. And Tom Sandoval does not value an emotional connection because he is only looking for people to worship the ground that he walks on. Allie and DJ James Kennedy, my my baby DJ James Kennedy, have this like little scene. And I realized that Allie is early seasons Ariana. You know, like she's encouraging James to go to therapy. She doesn't really put up with his shit. She thinks that he's like being, you know, destructive and she's not going to like be bulldozed by his bullshit. And I really like that about Allie. I don't think that James is right for Allie, but I think a girl like Allie is right for James. Um, she encourages James to go to therapy and James has like a very Desi South Asian man reaction to therapy. He's like, people only go to therapy if their life is in shambles and my life isn't in shambles, babe, (laughs) babe, come on. But also like it made me laugh because I was like, oh, right. South Asian people have an issue with therapy because they were colonized and we (laughs) function, not we, because I love therapy as you know, um, but they function like the birds do where you just push your feelings down to the bottom and you convince yourself everything is fine because as long as you're producing and as long as you're making money, then how could your life be in shambles? Ugh. Anyway, um, it's a day of this uh, something about her party. Everyone's getting ready and the Toms are at Schwartz's apartment and they talk about this tabloid story that's going around that Raquel and Schwartz were seen making out all night long at some club. Is everybody else thinking what I was thinking, which is like clearly Tom Sandoval and Raquel were probably seen kissing by somebody. And in order to put a squash to that, they probably released something that it was Schwartz and Raquel that were kissing, right? Clearly. I mean, what the hell does Tom have on Tom that Schwartz is putting up on, uh, on putting up with all of this? Like, I, I, I feel so fucking bad for Katie, man. I feel so bad for her. Ugh, we head to this uh, something about her gathering. The place is cute. The sandwiches look good. The sandwiches look yummy. I'm really happy to see people eating carbs on a show on Bravo. It's very good for me. Um, of course, a show on Bravo that isn't like Atlanta or Potomac or Married to Medicine or New Jersey where people actually eat. Um, James comes with Allie just briefly because he has going to be taking a flight out to Georgia to play a show, a three-day festival. Happy for James. Happy for James to even be like in the footnotes of a flyer with Cascade. Good for him. It is all about making connections, James. Good for you. But they have this conversation with Lisa who sh- who shows up and – um you know, I kind of like the way Allie kind of really gets to show Lisa that she's not a pushover. And I enjoy it. And I think Lisa enjoyed it too. Lisa enjoyed it, but I know somewhere in Lisa's mind, she was like, oh, you're going to be a broken bird one day and I can't wait for that. Um, anyway, everyone comes. It's lovely. And then they head to Sir, where a sociopath Raquel is just fucking grinning in the corner like the asshole that she is. And Ariana's just such a good fucking person because she goes up to Tom and she's like, I'm going to get fucked up. I'm going to drink with you and I'm going to turn up for you. Like, here's Ariana course correcting the very next day. Like she says that, you know, Tom Peacock's for everyone and he like puts on a show for everyone and he has to be the loudest person in the room because he likes that kind of attention. But that's not who I want to always be around. I don't want to be around the person who's a showman. I want to be around the normal person, the chill person that I probably had intimate moments with. And she knows that the partying and the socializing is important to Tom. So she's like, I'm going to do that for you. I'm going to course correct for you. Is Tom going to course correct for Ariana? No, he's not. We know he's actively not. Um, Schwartz and Terry, Katie's mom, have like a little talk and it's like, ugh, whatever. Like, I feel bad for Katie in this scene because even though her mom is trying to talk to Schwartz to like, drive home the importance of Katie's feelings. As a parent, it made me really mad that Terry was like still showing so much grace and empathy and kindness to Schwartz because he doesn't deserve any right now, right? Like he doesn't, he deserves to be screamed at. He deserves to be iced out by Terry. Like I want my mom, like my mom told me (laughs) a long time ago that when you get into big, big fights with your husband, like when you squabble with your husband, 
I don't really want to hear about it because then I'm going to hate your husband. And she was like, unless, of course, like it's life and death and like something really terrible is happening and you're getting abused or something like that, like then I want you to absolutely tell me. But my mom told me a long time ago, like, don't tell me if your husband is constantly making you upset because I will then hate this man, right? Because that's how my mom is. She is loyal to me like a dog, obviously, and I am to all of you. Like I, I am that way with my friends too. I will. You might get over it, but I will keep a record in the back of my mind about your husband being a trash goblin, and I will be nice to his face. I'm not an, a monster, but if you know shit hits the fan, I will ice that motherfucker out. And I really wish that Terry would ice out Schwartz, but Schwartz seems to keep getting so much fucking empathy from everybody, even fucking Lisa by the end of it. Um, Ariana and Raquel have possibly one of the most chilling conversations that we've ever seen on Vanderpump Rules. They're by the bar. And I felt like this entire conversation, a couple of things were happening for Raquel. One, I think she was trying to get a gauge for really what is going on in her relationship, like with Tom and Ariana's relationship, probably because Tom is convincing her that things are not great, right? But also she does this thing where she's essentially trying to insinuate that Ariana should leave Tom if she's not having sex with him. She's like, you know, I left, she says something like, I should have left James two years before I did because we had stopped having sex. And Ariana's like, yeah, I mean, that's not really the case with us. Like things can get better with us. We just need to communicate. But It was so fucking diabolical that Raquel was essentially trying to get Ariana to break up with Tom. Can you, can you fucking believe this shit? My God. Um, Lala and Lisa talk about babies. I don't care. Um, Tom Schwartz loves, rubs lemons on his, I can't believe I wrote this down. Tom Schwartz rubs lemons on his armpits. Yuck. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's it. Um, Katie is sitting with her friends, minding her own fucking business. Okay. And Raquel comes and tries to start some shit. And this is where, like, again, it's another example of Raquel is just repeating and saying whatever it is that Sandoval believes, right? So even in that conversation he had, she has with Ariana being like, if you're not attracted to your boyfriend, like, maybe you shouldn't even be with him. Like, that's probably what Tom Sandoval is telling Raquel, right? Like, I don't even think Ariana wants to be with me. I feel like things are already on the out. I feel like her one foot is out the door because she doesn't even want to have sex with me. And here's Raquel being like giving her the little push to really get both feet out the door, right? Because she is only absorbing whatever it is that Sandoval is telling her because she's not actually being herself. She is only repeating what the man she is in love with is saying. She doesn't actually have her own personality. So her even coming up to Katie and trying to be like, oh, I want to defend Schwartz. Schwartz is such a good guy. It bothers me that he doesn't have the balls to say anything to Katie. That's the shit that that Tom Sandoval has been saying all this time. That fucking scene from that bachelor party where he's like, look at her. Look at him. He's a battered wife. This is Sandoval's voice. Like that's 100% Sandoval's voice and words through and through. Raquel says like, I don't like the way that you're telling Schwartz that you're not going to, that you're going to keep the dogs. You're, you're going to threaten to take the dogs away from him. The very beginning of this season, James had to find out that Graham wasn't well because you took your dog away from James. The the level of unawareness that Raquel has is truly mind-boggling. And I used to think that there was like a neurodivergent issue. I used to feel really bad for her. And obviously, I think that she's getting manipulated by Sandoval. But as I watch this season, I realize like I don't feel bad for her because she's a gorgeous, wealthy white girl. Honestly, I don't feel bad for you. You have privilege in every single way that you could possibly get it. You walked onto this show and made it a season about yourself. I don't feel bad for you. You are not being manipulative, manipulated. You are manipulative. I don't feel bad for you at all. Um, She is, yeah, she's just fighting Schwartz's battles and the way she's looking at Katie. Like Katie says, like, I don't know what possessed Raquel to say these things to me. I'll tell you what it was. It was Tom Sandoval. Tom Sandoval, I think they found pictures of um, Tom, Raquel, and Joe and Schwartz all out in the same outfits 
I believe the night before, like earlier in the day from the day of that shooting. So we're already full blown into this mess. Joe and Schwartz were already hooking up at this point. Sandoval and Raquel are already hooking up at this point. So her coming in guns blazing to comfort Katie, she's only doing it because she wants to please the man that she's in love with. She doesn't actually care about Schwartz. She doesn't actually care about her friendship with Schwartz. She only cares about making Tom happy by attacking people that Tom doesn't like. That's all it is. Things get worse because she's rude as hell to Terry, okay, Katie's mom. And apparently, allegedly, it was cut out from the episode, but Tom Sandoval told Terry Terry to shut the fuck up. He says that it's tacky for Katie to be having her mom fight her battles. Um, It's tacky for you to take your mom's retirement money from years of, like, being a fucking firefighter and using it to waste away money on a bar that's not making any fucking money. Tom Sandoval is jumping in. He's fucking defending Raquel and Schwartz while Schwartz is hiding behind bushes. And Ariana is crying in this situation because, again, she is a person who wants to navigate these relationships without by showing that, like, I'm not getting influenced by anybody else. I am I'm friends with people based on how they treat me. And she doesn't know what to do. And it's so sad. It's so shitty because Sandoval doesn't even fucking comfort her. But I want everybody to focus on the fact that like Tom Sandoval loves himself more than anything else. And the reason why he hates Katie is because Katie knows he's a piece of shit because Katie has his number. And so more than defending Schwartz or even caring about Raquel or loving Ariana, none of those things are actually important to him, not more than how much he loves himself. He loves himself the most. And so that's why he comes for Katie so hard. That's why he puts Katie down so hard. Shorts and Katie are trying to talk. And again, Raquel hops in like a fucking sociopath. And I think what really broke my heart is that this episode really reminded me that Katie was used by Schwartz and Sandoval and Raquel. They made her look like an asshole. They played with her emotions. They embarrassed her all as a decoy so that those two, Sandoval and Raquel, could fuck on the side and not get caught. And he just, Sandoval, just needed more time to push this narrative that Ariana is like mean and a nag and not nice and doesn't get toilet paper and pens and batteries and she never has sex with him and she looks down on him. He he wanted people to think that she's a bad person. He didn't get enough time because he got caught. I'm sure, I'm sure if if all this stuff didn't come out uh, with Scandaval in March, this season, we would have continued this narrative of like Ariana's a bad person and Ariana's this and Ariana's that so that people could really start to hate Ariana. He wanted to make a villain out of her so that he looks like a good person. He doesn't actually care about Raquel. He doesn't actually care about Schwartz. He only cares about the way that he is perceived publicly. That's it. That's all he cares about. That's why he keeps coming for Katie. His hatred for Katie is because he loves himself so much. His hatred for Katie isn't because he cares about Schwartz or Raquel or anybody else. It's because he loves himself. And it's the same way he hated Stasi. It's because he loves himself. He doesn't care about anybody else. Um, hilariously, hilariously, the end of this episode, Guillermo brings a cake for Lisa's birthday. <laughs> so awkward. Lisa gives her little finale speech about growing and loving and laughing and living and cheating and crying and <laughs> and how she's, you know, profiting. She's taking this to the bank on the backs of these kids' mem- miseries. And good for you, Lisa Vanderpump. Good for you. Um, anyway, that's it. Those are my thoughts. This is the end of this uh, episode. And I hope that you are having a lovely Sunday. Um, I will be back later next week to talk about succession and pop culture and uh, Vanderpump Rules. Obviously, the finale is going to be electric. I'm hopefully going to try to get my cousin Aisha because you guys love that episode and uh, we have a great time talking. So I'm hopefully going to try to get her to come on to talk about uh, Vanderpump Rules with me. I'm hopefully going to get some guests to talk about New Jersey and Atlanta. So stick around. Tune in. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. And I will talk to you next time. Bye.